first, uh, I want to say I'm blessed to be in this situation. Uh, don't take it for granted the seat that I get to sit in. Uh, I want to thank the Spanos family, Tom Telesco, uh, Coach Staley, first of all, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'd be remiss not to thank the Cardinals, Michael Bidwell, Steve Kime, Cliff Kingsbury, Jeff Rogers, Kenny Bell, the guys that helped me get to this. And then the players. I mean, I, I talked to the players that I coached all of the years, and I wouldn't be in this seat at this age uh, without them. I'm not here because I'm some guru. I'm here because the relationships I've had with the players and the performances they put on the field. You know, so I'm excited for this opportunity, uh, excited to be with the Chargers family. And that's the thing you hear is that it's a family. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And I look forward to all the things we're going to do uh, going forward, building this foundation that uh, Coach Staley has uh, implemented and wants to execute uh, down the road. So I appreciate you guys taking your time to talk a little fourth down ball today. And uh, I guess I'll open up for questions now. Sounds good. Uh, we'll start off by uh, Cam Buford. Hey, good morning, Darius. How you doing? Good morning, Cam. Um, I want to ask you, kind of, what are your keys to having quality special teams? Is it whether it be the punt, ret the return team, or the kicking team? What are your keys to having quality uh, special teams? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Cam. And the thing you're going to hear me say this over and over, and you're going to get tired of hearing it. And the players are going to hear it. And I stick by three things. And we talk about the three F's of football. And it's and it's not going to be grammatically correct, but it sticks with the players. And it's we're going to play fast, we're going to play physical, and fundamentally sound. You know, my mom's an English teacher, so that's phonetically that's correct. <laughs> you could correct. get in trouble for but, that one. <laughs> you know, so I get a little credit for using the word phonetically in a press conference. So that's my mom. Um, but yeah, those are the three things we stick with. And when I talk about fast, it's not everybody has to run a 4-4, you know, it's maximizing whatever you do, the best of your ability to play as fast as you are. If you're a 4-7, I want you to play a 4-7 in every single phase. You know, physical, it's whatever you do, do it physically. You know, it's a physical sport um, and, and guys use their tools in different ways and that doesn't mean going to blow somebody up. That just means do it with physicality. You know, you see a guy like Tyreek Hill, he plays physically fast, you know what I mean? And so then the last thing, is just fundamentally sound. You can't do anything without fundamentals. And that's what we're gonna be based around, uh, taking every single day. And I tell the guys from the time we go training camp all season up until you know this last week of the Super Bowl, we're gonna be doing the same fundamentals every day and just training those guys that use those things within whatever scheme we build around them. Um, building a relationship with your players, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I think it's just investing time in who they are as people. You know, I, I, I start my first meeting every year, and I've done this the last probably six years as I've gotten older, is I tell them my job as a coach and any coach's job is to make sure that at the end of training camp, they are employed in the NFL. And a lot of them look at me crazy like, what are you talking about? I'm here with the chart. Well, you know, we bring in 90 guys. We can't have 90 on the roster. And I think that my job is to reach them in a way of whatever it is, tap into whatever makes them go so that they're employed. And I think once they see that you're committed to them as people and having them employed and providing for their families, and that's beyond football, you know, and, and that's really where I think my connections come with them. And it's the conversations, you know, maybe it's in the meal room, maybe it's walking to practice in the meeting room before, and you just naturally get a feel for guys. You ask about their parents, their kids, their wives, girlfriends, and you just throughout the year, you spend so much time with them. That's where the bond builds. I don't think it's any, any secret formula. It's just a relationship and building and it grows and it grows. And it's not always going to be roses and sunshine, right? Like it's going to have the tough times and that's what makes you grow. And when you look back on it, you laugh about it at the end of the season, talk about those conversations. So I think that's how I build the relationship with those guys. And lastly, lastly for me, um, what do you think of, what, what's your lasting memory of the Tidewater area? Oh gosh. I mean, 757, that's first, you know, we, we go by that area code and uh it's just athletes right like when i think of that area it's you can't think of anything but athletes if you're going uh, football for me is ronald curry uh then you go michael vick and people don't understand michael vick was second team all district his entire career in high school because of ronald curry then you got alan iverson i mean you got you go across the water you got alonzo morning jr Reed. so it's just to me it's athleticism and it's competition and that's something coach staley talks about all the time and that's how you're bred in virginia is that no matter what You've got to compete, whether it's at the Boys and Girls Club, whether it's at high school. You know, I went to Hampton University, was competing there. We were competing against the guys from Virginia Tech would come down and do seven on seven in the summers against us. So it's just competition athleticism is really what I think about when I think about the 757.
Congratulations on your opportunity, man. I, I look forward it. to working with you. Have a good Thank one. Thank you, too. Michael Peterson. Hey, Coach. It's great to meet you. Hey, Michael. How you doing, man? So Coach Staley said that in Arizona, you had sort of a game management role. You helped with situational decision making. What did that look like in Arizona? Like, uh, just kind of extrapolate on that, what that process looked like. Yeah, I don't want to give away the secrets that they have going on uh, in Arizona, but it just entailed a constant flow of communication between three individuals. It was three of us uh, constantly throughout the game talking situational football. Uh, I always tell you, try to see the landmines before they blow up, you know what I mean? because our head coach was a play caller. So you don't want to bother him when he's in a flow and rhythm of the game. And he's one of the best offensively to do it. So we try the three individuals and we try to constantly have that conversation of what's happening next. Well, what if this happens? What if they score here? What if we stop them? Um, you know, how can we manage the clock? Are we going to need two more possessions? And I think it was just that flow of communication situationally that helped us be one of the better teams. If you look at two minute, you look at four minute in the game, uh, it's just communication and to think that we streamlined that communication so that we didn't have to bother the play callers and that after they were done calling plays or before the series, uh, we would have that dialogue, you know, with them, uh, with him before, before he went out. So I think that's, I don't, you know, I don't want to tell who said this, but you know, I think you get a feel for it, Michael. When you have a kicker going through issues, whether it's, you know, his setups off, maybe it's something between the ears, where do you kind of start to help them get through some of these rough patches? The Chargers had a little bit of a, one of these patches with Michael Badgley. I mean, he does have, you know, some franchise records, 59 yard or a couple of years ago, but how do you get them through those rough patches? Yeah. And, and you guys will hear throughout the year is that when it comes to the specialists, I consider myself their caddy. That's all I am. You know, they're pros. Uh, they're going to hit just like a golfer. They're going to hit rough stretches, right? And a good caddy isn't in his ear. Hey, you should do this. Hey, you should do that. I really think it's recommendations, right? I got to get a feel for what are you seeing? What am I seeing? And if they match up, then I don't even need to have a long conversation. But I think when they go through tough stretches, just like a golfer, or you look at uh, a basketball player whose shot is off at this level, they know what it is. And my job is to make sure they know, okay, what it is, are they seeing it right? Are they feeling it right? And then all we do is watch the film, have a conversation in the meeting room, and we go from there. You know, now it's situations where you just, it's case by case basis, but I'm not one of those guys that I'm going to have a long dialogue. And no, it's, it's their pros. I'm just a caddy and I recommend clubs at times. And then we go from there, you know. And uh, lastly, what are some of your best motivational practices when it comes to coaching special teams? This is obviously the third phase of the game. It's not going to get the headlines, despite it being very important to, to the overall success of the team. How do you keep people in the right mindset and, and the right energy? Well, it, it's something that I learned in high school. And I didn't play special teams in high school, but I never forget a coach of mine always said, and I've said this before, is that no football game in the history of football, and if you can find one, let me know, has started a game without a kickoff and kickoff return. And everybody else, except for the kickoff and kickoff return team, are backups. So that's my first selling point. There are no starters. In the Super Bowl, I'm sorry, Patrick Mahomes will not start the game. It will be Garrison Butker. It will be all those guys on kickoff. It will be the kickoff return team. It's just, I mean, if you can pull a game where they start any other way, I'll let me know. But that's a big selling point, you know. Uh, you look at our kickoff team in Arizona this year, Isaiah Simmons, number one pick. You ask him where his first snap was, it was on kickoff. And so I think that you make that first, that's a joke to them. but then. It is a thing where you see good teams use that and good players want to be on it. You know, if you look at our special teams, Patrick Peterson, he would he would jump out there at either returner or at corner for us. And I think when you build that culture, just like Coach Staley believes in, uh, it's not a phase that we're all together. We all work together. I would, I would, you know, differ with you in saying special teams is very important with field position, right? We have Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert doesn't want to start inside the 25. At bare minimum, we got to get him starting with a touchback. You know, same thing with Joey Bosa. He doesn't want to have to cover 75 yards of field. I think he'd rather go than go 80 or 85. So it's just working together and the team will see that we're all a part of it and that the emphasis is, hey, I want to be a part of something special. And I think that's the culture we built uh, in Arizona. If you look, you know, our kickoff team, just it was like a party. You know, guys, guys were like just partying on, and guys wanted to be on that unit and wanted to be on all the teams. So when you build that, and it's really, though, they take ownership of it. And you just, as a coach, you just sit back and implement the schemes week to week and, and give them the fundamentals to, to be successful. Awesome. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Gilbert Manzano. Hello, Darius. Nice, nice to meet you. How you doing, Gilbert? 
Doing well. Uh, uh, Darius, uh, just curious, because uh, you're obviously you're well qualified. You've been a coordinator before with the 49ers. So I'm sure that's why uh, uh, Brandon recruited you. But for you, why was it the right, I guess, the right fit to come to the Chargers? Oh, man. I mean, first of all, you just, you, you just Brandon Staley, right? Like as a man. To a man, he, he's probably one of the most genuine people I've ever, ever been around. I don't know if he has bad days. I mean, he's just his energy is always up. And just his vision for what he's going to build this team to be, you know, where it's just collaboration. People talk about it, but everybody being a, just a first, a good person, good character, and then good coaches and just bleeding that over into the players. And that was a big, big thing for me is that I feel like you have to want to work for the person and not just because of the job. It's because of them. It's because of, you know, Coach Staley, because of Amy and the three boys, right? Like it, it's that, it's that feeling of like, I don't want to let his family down. And that I care about him more than just the coach. I think that was the most attractive thing because you've worked for different people over the years. But when you can work with somebody who you really feel like is genuine and, and you know, is of their word, that, that was a big selling point. And then obviously the roster and things like that came into play afterwards. But that was the main thing for me uh, when he presented this to me. It was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Uh, you, you guys worked together in Chicago. I forget how many, maybe one or two years. Uh, but you being on a special team and him being on defense, you guys kind of you know collaborate a lot often or talked or became closer in that time? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you this, Gilbert. Uh, Brandon Staley is one of the few coaches that was in every single special teams meeting. I mean, he would, he would be there in the back. And when I was interviewing, I was going through some of my stuff and he's calling it out. And, his re and you're just, I'm just like, all right, well, I, I thought I was interviewing, but you know, <laughs> coach, you, can, you know, so that it, it was definitely, he was in it and he was a part of it. And you know, I'm looking at his drills, what he's doing with some of those, because we, you know, some of those outside linebackers were playing on special teams and just the correlation in that. And so that's where the relationship built. And it's just that that camaraderie. And when a coach, a position coach takes the time out to sit in your meeting, you know, as a special teams coach, it shows that it means something not only to him, but to the team, to the head coach. So that's where that relationship started. And I think uh, that's where it just keeps, it'll keep growing from here. And there's, I know you just got here, so you can't watch too much of the film of last year, but it didn't work out too well for the Chargers and special teams a year ago. Uh, it might have been because of inexperienced players. Do you think it's vital on special teams to kind of maybe, you know, make it work or click to get experienced guys and on that phase of football, or can it really work with guys who are new, undrafted rookies and experienced guys? Yeah, I think Gilbert is just, it's just, I, I give the analogy when, when building special teams, I think building the team, it, it's like making a meal, right? Like, I don't worry about, you know, what groceries I have. I just, take the groceries I have in my cabinet and I make a meal, right? Like, I don't care if I have fresh fruit or the fruit's a day old or it's a week old. And as long as it's not spoiled, we can make a meal. And so, you know, would you love to have guys that are, you know, Matthew Slaters that are 12 year Pro Bowl guys all over the place? Yeah, but that's not the real realistic view of the NFL, right? Your rosters are gonna fluctuate here and there. And you just, as a coach, have to give them tools to be successful. And I think that's what, you know, I'm charged to do with no who, whoever's on the roster. We got to find what they do best and put them in those situations uh, to be successful. So age and those things, they'll vary, you know, you selfishly. Yeah, I wish I had a 10 Pro Bowlers. Obviously, everybody wants that, right? Like, so, but realistically, you take your groceries, whatever you're given, and you make the best meal you can make every single week. And last thing, there is, uh, I'm assuming that uh, Jeff Rogers was a big influence in your coaching path. Uh, I guess, uh, what did you learn from him the most? I think you were with him in Chicago and in Arizona and maybe other places too. Yeah, we, we were together in Denver, we were together in Chicago and in Arizona. And uh, when, you, when you talk about somebody, and I was talking about Brandon and just being on a personal level, Jeff Rogers went from being a coworker to a brother the time that we worked together and learning from him. And he was started as a coordinator at Kansas State and then came to the NFL and was young like I am now. And uh, just seeing his career and, and how his trajectory and things he taught me and just seeing how his relationships with the players. And also, and I think it was a key part for our success, just bouncing things off of each other and personality wise, right? Good cop, bad cop. There's some days where they love him and they hate me. And, there's some, and I think that when you build that relationship over the years, the players see it and they come together and say, okay, well, if I'm mad at Jeff, I can go talk to Darius or Darius is getting on my nerves. I can go talk to Jeff. And I think working with him and learning from him and just growing from, you know, just coworker to brother, just helped my career and my life in so many ways. I'm always indebted to him. And he knows that. Thank you, Darius. Thank you. Fernando Ramirez. Hey, Darius. Nice to meet you.
How you doing, Fernando? Good, thank you. Uh, what excites you the most about coming out to LA and and getting to uh, be around this team and and kind of what you've seen from them? Uh, I don't know how much attention you've paid to the team uh, in the past, but just uh, being around them and everything. I mean, Fernando, I'll tell you this, that's a great question. Um, when you look at this team and you're watching, I have watched them a bit on film. It's a team that, and I've been, and you guys probably know, eight different teams, right, in 13 years. And when you come to a team, you're looking and it's like, all right, I'm just looking from a global view. I, I didn't really, I wasn't in meetings and all those things. And what you see with this team is they play hard. I mean, play hard. They, they play sound football and they don't quit. I mean, you even look at the last game, a lot of teams say, all right, we're not in the playoff hunt and, and we're playing the Super Bowl chance and they're not playing their best guys. The guys took it to them and it's just every week. And I think that's exciting where you have a group of guys that it's already instilled with them that they're going to play four quarters, play hard. Because that's one thing you don't want to have to teach, you know, and coach up is effort. And uh, there, there really looks like a group that has fun while they're playing the game. And you just, it, that's an exciting thing to see because you know you're going into a place where, hey, guys love ball or it shows out on film. You just want to build on that and create a foundation for more success in the future. And then Darius, uh, we, I mean, listening and, and to what coach uh, Staley had to say last week and then to some of the uh, the coordinators they talk about relationships and the way they build relationships with the team with the players uh, kind of what's your view on that and it, it seems like Brandon Staley's really putting together guys that can that have good relate great relationships with their players I mean I think uh, Fernando that's that's key right like I'll spend more time with these guys and you end up spending at home with your significant other, your kids. So, so relationships is big. Like it's just a big deal when it comes to any sport. I, I just feel like you're around these guys all the time and you get to know them as people. And if you don't get to know them as people, then work isn't as fun, right? Like I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know if you're coming in and you're usually a juice guy and you're up and you're coming in one morning, and you're down. I really want to know how can I get you? How can I help you? Because it's going to be days like that where I'm going to have to pull somebody along. Somebody have to pull me along. And it's a long season and things aren't going to be easy. And I think those relationships are what get the good teams over the hump. You know what I mean? And, and just knowing that when you go out there, it's easy to say, oh, I'm going to go, you know, cover a kick. But if I know I'm going to cover a kick so that, hey, Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram, Durham James can go stop them so we can get a punt return and we get the ball to Justin. Justin's going to score. And you start thinking in that way and the whole team – start seeing like, he's going to do that for me and I'm going to do that for him. And now you're as a coach, you don't have to really worry too much about guys not having their assignments right not because you know they care. And if you know they care, you know they're going to work to the best of their ability to execute whatever you put in. And that's a big thing. That's why relationships are something, you know, Coach Staley has as a foundation. And I think that's something we're going to build on and grow and grow and just, you look at the Spanos family, the first thing I've seen on the pictures is welcome to the family. And that's a big deal, you know? And when it's family across the board, there's, it's limitless what you can do. And last one for me, how excited are you to get to get to work with this team? Oh my goodness. I mean, I, I've been talking ball and I, I told uh, Brandon in the interview, we talked for two hours and I, I was just so excited because I, you, you do something for six months, right? Every day. And then you get a few weeks off and you're kind of like, you get back into it. Like, oh yeah, this is what I like doing. This is what I do. And it's like, okay, I want to get back to ball, but you know, my, you know, at home, it's kind of like, no, 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 not, not too fast, buddy. You've been gone for six months. So it's uh, it's an excitement to get out there and go to work. But I also, there's other things you have to handle. And uh, knowing that the off season's that, but we have some work to do and we're excited to get done and get to LA and start a new life there and build a foundation with the Chargers. Darius, I appreciate it. Uh, nice meeting you and congratulations. Thank you, Fernando. Look forward to talking to you. Uh, Daniel Popper. Hey, Darius, nice to meet you. Hey, Daniel. We got, I should start by saying we got a history lesson on Ronald Curry from Tyrod Taylor uh, earlier this season or last season. So we, <laughs> I did, I, I went up and looked up his Wikipedia page and, and it all makes sense now why everyone yeah. references him first over Vic. <laughs> yeah, Tyrod, funny thing, Tyrod, I started quarterback in the Virginia High School All-Star game. The next year was Marcus Vic. I think three years later was Tyrod Taylor. So, you know. We share some common traits there. Tyrod will give you a nice lesson on all those guys. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to expand a little bit on this idea of like teaching inexperienced players, because I think regardless of sort of who's on the roster, you're going to end up with some, some green talent there on special teams, whether it's, you know, draft picks, undrafted guys. What, what is your approach to teaching inexperienced guys how to play special teams when you don't obviously have a ton of practice time on the field and, you know, 
in like in this last season, for example, maybe no preseason games or something like that. How do you how do you approach teaching and experience guys? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in these times, right, virtually and like I said, not having person, we had to come up with so many unique ways to, to touch the players, right? And and not going old school, you don't get to be on the field with them. So what we would do is just find different ways through tools such as, you know, Zoom. We had different cut-ups we'd send to them. Then we had like uh we made we made our own voiceovers, you know, five minute voiceovers and no longer than five minutes because this is the Instagram generation, right? They can't handle anything over two to five minutes and then it's gone. It's, it's, it's out of there. You can't five minutes. That's about it with this generation. Love them to death, but that's all you can give them. So we figured out that was our, we give them five minute clips a day. They'd watch it. They'd watch it. All, and we would tell them, watch it before you come in. And it's only five minutes, right? They want, they, they don't care if it's five minutes. And then as we came to the next meeting, virtually it would be a dialogue. It would be more of that instead of them trying to learn it for the first time. And I think that helped us. I think also when you get them in person, just as I said, it's going to be fundamentals, fundamentals, and just repping it over and over and over in their skill set. And then in the classroom, it's just making it so they can understand it. If they can't teach it back to me, then I have to change the way I teach, not the other way around. You know, and, and that's really what I believe is a player should be able, after you put in a technique or you put in a scheme, he should be able to spit it back to you. And if he can't, you have to adjust as a teacher. That's really what it is. And so those are the different ways we really handled that. Um, some of the younger guys and not having them in person last offseason. Hopefully we can grow on that this offseason here in L.A. So when you say voiceovers, you you were talking over tape cutups? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We would do our, you know, when they opened up the, because you don't want to get in trouble, excuse me, with the NFL. And, but it was when the period was open where you could do the meetings and things. We would do the voiceovers beforehand. And we would just tell them, you know, hey, go watch uh, voiceover number one and two the night before whatever meeting we were actually going to cover it. And that way they would have it, you know, visually and audibly. So that they're, therefore, when they came into the meeting, it wasn't just brand new, you know. And I think that was a great tool that some of the guys really liked because it was just like, hey, I don't have to worry about, you know, I go in the meeting, I'm like, you know, writing, writing, writing. It's like, okay, I had it the night before. I kind of get a feel for it. And then I come into the meeting and, and I it can just a refresher. Right. The next step would be creating your own Instagram account. So it just shows up on their Instagram feed instead of actually. Yeah. Instead of oh, man. That's, I, that would just, you know, I mean, that every one of them, you, from the time you give them a break in a meeting, it's the phone. So you got to find, oh, yeah. right, creative ways to tap into them because that's what they, that's what they respond to. I mean, they can learn a new TikTok dance in 30 seconds. So you got <laughs> to catch them because that's the way they learn. So I'll adjust with it. If, if that's something we have to do and they say I learned it better that way, we'll figure it out from there. Absolutely. Uh, going back to the, the game management stuff that you were doing in Arizona, do you expect to have a similar role on and Brandon staff? Has that been ironed out at all? No, we just, you know, I think it's just up to Brandon how, how he wants to do it. You know, I'm a resource and I think just anytime you're with a team and a head coach, uh, situational football for special teams coach is something naturally we have to do, right? Like it's just something that we look at because we're seeing third down and then it's a punt, it's a punt return. Okay, kickoff, are we trying to kick it deep? Are we trying to sky kick? Are we going to run a fake here? So I think just naturally, as especially important, you in your mind and talking to your assistant just as far as situated football. So we'll iron out what that role will be, how we'll go about that. But I think we'll see what Brandon wants to do and whatever he wants to do. Obviously, I'll do it to the best of my ability. Obviously, a big part of game management in today's NFL is looking at analytics, whether it's win probability models or, or things of that nature with, with two-point conversions. Were you, do you look at that stuff when you were doing that stuff in Arizona? Was that something that was a part of your calculus when you were helping with game management stuff or, or not really? Yeah, I think that was a part of that conversation I was talking about earlier with three people. Um, that, that stuff came into play. I think that's, I think you always, and I love analytics. Um, I, I think it's, it's great. You know, you talk about the NBA and some guy, like they really stick to it. I believe in this, in that analytics plays a great role. Numbers are great, but I also think there's a feel to the game too, right? And I think that's that has to be balanced. And I think that's something we did well in Arizona and those voices, you know, something we had those dialogues and sometimes like, well, the book says this. And then somebody chime in, well, the game says this. <laughs> and so that's the right. Yeah, and that's just, you know, how the game goes. So analytics is great and you want to tap into it. But I think that's what makes, you know, Brandon a great coach. He has a great feel for the game. And I think that's something he will have a great feel for taking the numbers and then also going, what does the game look like, you know, in front of me? Awesome. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, Daniel. All this talk about social media, it only feels right to go to Joe Reedy, our, our viral uh, beat writer. <laughs> Next. 
Well, Josh, you you did get your uh, couple minutes on the podcast too, so. <laughs> uh darius welcome aboard i actually Hello. worked at the daily press from uh 02 to 04 newport news so okay so you were there when i was at hampton yeah um yeah. where does michael vick rate on your list of uh 757's greatest qbs oh he's okay no you're trying to get me in trouble i <laughs> i asked the same i asked the same thing of tyrod I, I'm putting him in. If you're saying strictly when they were in high school, are you saying total? Because I'm saying high school. Know, in high school, I've heard, I'm I've heard in high school was phenomenal. Yeah, in high school, I'm taking Ronald Curry all day. Okay. Um, and and but now I would think they're both very happy with how it ended up with Ronald Curry being a coach in New Orleans and Michael Vick doing whatever he wants to do and doing a great job on TV. But I just you know I tell people all the time if you've never seen Ronald Curry play high school football, it was like a grown man just amongst boys. And they would close the gates at kickoff and it would just, the fire marshal say, no more people. And, I, and, and I've and i never seen high school games like that except when I was in college and we'd go over to Norfolk State and see Percy Harvin. So, I mean, that I had some fun times, <laughs> you know, in that area growing up and you're in college and we got a game on Saturday and we're sneaking to go over across the water to see Percy Harvin and Lansdowne to see what they do. And it was, that was a show too, you know, Bobby Bowden showing up at the time and, you know, Urban Meyer showing up. So I got some good memories of players down there, but I would have to take Ronald Curry in high school as a quarterback over Michael Vick. Okay. As far as, you know, getting guys to buy in on special teams, how hard of a job is it for you? Or is it easier with like the third string running back or, some of those cornerbacks convincing them that your way to make the roster is through teams? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a good question because it's a case by case basis. I think it starts with, you know, we have a head coach here who believes in teams. He believes in con contributing to the team. And I think when it starts like that, it's easier. But I also think it is scenarios where it's tough for guys that are coming from an Ohio state and Alabama where they were the man and now their role is going to be, especially to start. And I always tell guys, listen, I've got stories of days, of days and days of players who they came in and were on special teams. And now all of a sudden, because I, I tell them, you want to get paid. You're not playing for free. So let me tell you about guys that ended up getting paid. And so, you know, I talk about Chris Harris. I, I, I mean, I have a real Chris Harris had the most dominant four weeks of a gunner from preseason to the regular season that I've seen in the NFL. I just, I mean, he, and that's how he became you know, a starter is his uh, first year in the league. And then you go somebody like Austin Eckler. He was covering kicks as a gunner as well. You know, Virgil Green, he was with us in Denver. So there's stories and stories. Just like I said, Isaiah Simmons, you know, he was covering. I mean, he, he was blowing guys up on kickoff. And it's just when you have those examples, Joe, I think it helps to transition because naturally there's going to be some frustration where I come from college and played 60 snaps and now I'm coming to the NFL and I might play 15. So I think it's one, the head coach and just his emphasis on it. I think two, just you explaining to them their role on the team. And then three, giving them examples of, hey, this is not like a slap in the face or saying you're a bad player. This is just your role for now. And it might get you to where you want to go just a little different route than you envisioned. How much harder it was it this past year knowing what you had in a unit because in pre because special teams you can't run at full contact in full speed you right. really don't know until the games what you have and then how did you adjust during the season kind of you know fitting in different matches yeah i think we were blessed in arizona to have i want to say six returning core special teams guys like, and that's rare, right? Like, that's rare to have a young group that's been together. And then we had some vets that have played on teams. And for us, it really was getting them, okay, into shape during training camp and then letting the young guys show their what they could do in team reps. But the hardest thing, like you said, was getting those young guys ready when they had not seen what it's really going to look like. And you 
almost, you know, you're almost at the project with the younger guys when you can't hit full speed, just on body movements, how they look in drills, how they look at group work, teamwork, and you're projecting. And then as you go, I mean, just like anything, as the games go, you coach them up, you grade them up after a game, and then you rep it again in practice. And those guys just got better and better every week, the young ones, whereas the vets would just, they, I, they really, as the season went on, they took ownership of it and just, they flourished. And that's, that's really why I, you know, I'm really proud and Jeff is proud of where those guys were and how we ended up in special teams because they just, it was the players, they took ownership of it. And then just last thing for me, in terms of returners, how much do you kind of ask them about their style of run, favorite spots or lanes to go, but also kind of mirroring it with the, with the film of opponents going, this is where they like to attack and everything? Yeah, that's great, great, Joe. Like, we uh, have those conversations with those guys all the time. I mean, I have to watch the film and, and get a feel for them first and then have a conversation with them with, do you like this, do you like that? And then also it's, it's uh, you know, game management too. You know, having the conversation with those guys, of what type of game is it? You know, are you fair catching? What are you doing in, a, in terms of the entire game? And uh, we have those conversations, and you don't want to put a player in a situation he's not comfortable, right? You just, you just don't want to, if he's an outside returner, you don't want to keep calling middle returns. But he has to also know there are times we have to call certain things certain ways. And you just try to, I believe in, you build a scheme around the player's skill set, not the other way. So, you know, it's, it's constant dialogue. It's constant watching film. It's constantly having those guys. We have separate meetings for our returners where they watch guys in the league, make decisions, make big plays. And those guys love seeing other teams and other players, and they grow off of just seeing that. It's amazing how much they grow off seeing their, their uh, compadres and other, and other teams uh, do good and bad things. Sounds good. Can't wait. Thank to you so much, Joe. Shelly Smith. I'm mute. Uh, hi, Coach. I'm Shelly Smith. I work for ESPN. Um, hi, Shelly. Just about everything that could go wrong went wrong with this special teams unit this year. And I don't know how much you watched or seen. Where do you start? How do you fix this? Yeah, Shelly, I think for us, it's a process, right? Like we're coming in now and it's first, you got to evaluate. I always believe evaluate. Uh, where are we at? What do we do well? What do these guys do well? Okay. And then from there, I think we're just going to educate each other, the staff of what we're looking for. Um, in a, in a special teams player, what we ask certain guys to do in our system. And then after that, it's just implement our system with the players. You know, I, I, don't, I don't believe in looking backwards. I think it's just a process and you just go through that process every day. And, and you know, really talking to Tom, talking to Brandon, it's just a, like, how do we want to, what do we see in this position? Okay, what do you need from a third running back if he's going to play on offense with Joe or if he's going to be with me? Like, what do we both get out of the same thing with Ronaldo? Ronaldo, how do you see the fourth corner? How much is he going to play for you? What can he do? What type of body type do we like? You know, so it's, you know, you, edu you evaluate first, then you educate each other, educate the players when they come in, and then you just, you know, implement your system around what we do well. Because the cupboard's not empty here. I know, I know everybody's, you know, it, it's, 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 I get that, but the cupboard's not empty and we'll, we'll, we'll have a good foundation and we'll get it rolling. How do you evaluate talent when you, you're doing it on paper right now, but how will you evaluate talent? Yeah, as I've watched it, and I've watched every single play uh, from last year, I really just break down the individual. Every my... single play? Yeah, I mean, Shelly, I watch every play of every special teams every week. It's just part of what we do as special teams coaches. And you kind of, you, as you as it narrowed down and I got closer, and Brandon and I interviewed, I went to the interview, I had to. You know, you don't go into an interview and not watch the entire roster right. in case he asks you, you know. And so I've watched it all, and – you know, uh, you just, when I evaluate them, I'm looking at what they do and what they're comfortable doing just physically. Cause I wasn't in the meetings, right? I wasn't, I don't know what he's asked to do scheme wise. So I'm just looking at body type. How does he move? How does he adjust to these things? What does he like? What is the thing he likes to keep doing? And you just go from there. That's the beginning of the evaluation process. And then when we get into the office, you know, I'll start making cutups of guys and do like that and say, okay, in our system, this guy, he, I see that he does this. Can he do this? And that's how we'll keep going from there. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. All right, Darius, last one for you. Jeff Miller. Darius, the uh, managing games, uh, how do you go about educating yourself? Do you, will you watch, go back and watch situations of other teams around the league? How, how does a coach get that knowledge? Yeah, Jeff, great question. So like I said, I, I watch every, 
every special team snap every week, right? And so as you're watching it and you, you read articles and stuff, you're like, okay, how did this happen? Like, why did they punt? And then you go and you go to the offensive and defensive side of the ball and you watch, okay, they were in this situation, they punted with this. And then it's just the old school, you know, after a game, you're watching on TV. And so you see things. So I think it's a combination of all three. I start with the special teams part of it. And then I go to, if I see something on special teams, I'm like, okay, why did they do that there? And then I go to O and D and say, how did this situation, how did they lead up to this situationally? You know, how did they, where were they at timeouts? Um, with timeouts or time on the clock. And that's something I think I try to implement with the players too, that when you're watching film, look at the clock, look at timeouts, that dictates what the situ situation is. You know, is, is it, you know, are they up? Are they down? It, uh, where's the clock at in the half, in the quarter? Okay, and, and then you do it that way. And I think situationally, your brain starts to function that way as you watch it. And then, so like on Sunday, this past Sunday, if you're yeah. watching those two games, are you sitting there, like a lot of us are saying, what are you doing? Like, don't, you, you gotta go for it. You, I mean, you gotta- You, kick you it. guys are gonna think I'm crazy. Uh, and Brandon will tell you, we were texting each other during the day. <laughs> like, what would we do here situationally? I mean, we're football nuts, I guess you could say. I'm texting like, hey, in this situation, what do you think about this? And, and then he texts me back, and then he calls me. So, you know, it's, it's kind of your brain just doesn't – I can't watch it as, you know, just watching the game. It's just like, okay, situation – oh, we – and so then I just end up – I know he's like me, and he's watching, so I'm texting him. And then he calls me and says, yeah, da, da. so we're just – I just think the more your brain as a, in our entire staff, you know, coordinators work together with the head coach and we start seeing the game the same way, it's just going to work together. And you talk about it before it comes up so that when it does come up, you've done it a hundred times in your mind and on the field with the players. And there were some moments last year where Anthony Lynn explained to us there were some communication issues that happened that resulted in them doing some things that they probably in retrospect would have done differently. How, how do you avoid in the heat of the moment and the game's moving quick and things are happening fast. How did, what's the key to that communication not breaking down? Yeah, I can't speak for what they were doing. I can speak for where I've been. And I think that, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's the dialogue beforehand. I think that it's also, uh, you know, repping it in practice, just fine. You know, you have your catalog of situations and you rep them and you, the players start talking that same language. And, you know, whether it's Justin on offense, it's, Durbin on defense that are they get used to they start seeing the clock at practice they if they pick up on it and when you really have that culture every single person and I'm talking from the head coach the kicker you know might even be the trainers they are starting knowing they've seen it so much in different situations that they start picking up on it and that's how you build the community so that when you get to game day everybody starts to see it and it beforehand even happens you know he, Justin might run out there for a series and Joe's telling them hey, make sure of these things on the checklist. Or, you know, Brandon and I are talking about something before defensive series. And that's how I think for where I've been in my in my past is that that's how those situations, how you handle them. It's practice, it's community, talking to them in staff meetings and watching them on film with the team. You know, we had meetings uh, with Cliff in Arizona where the whole team, and I give him so much credit, Jeff Rogers, Cliff Kingsbury, and Kenny Bell would really get the whole team together and watch situational football and really be aware of those things. And I think that's just where the, you know, you can't wait until, you know, it's game time to really do it. And so I think that's how you keep those situations from, you know, biting you in the butt. But like I said, I can't speak to what was happening last year. Just we'll see how we handle it, but uh, you know, hopefully we'll get that and everybody's seeing the, everything the same way.